So let me first uh, introduce um, our panelists tonight. I'm actually going to do it in the order that they're speaking. Um, so the first one is Victoria Monroe, who's second on my left. She's the executive director of the Alice Austin House in Staten Island. Monroe is also an artist, art, and art history educator and curator. She's an active voice in projects related to the development of Staten Island's waterfront, including the Design Trust for Public Space. Ms. Monroe is, has also worked with the Cool Culture Laboratory for New Audiences program, which collaborates with families, schools, and museums to ensure equitable access to cultural resources and to propel social change. She will be followed by John Reddick on the end there. John's an architectural historian and Columbia University community scholar who conducts walking tours of Harlem with a focus on architecture, music, and history. John is actively engaged in Harlem's culture, art, and preservation. He's authored numerous articles and has spoken at the Apollo Theater, the Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Museum of the City of New York, and recently served as a curator and discussion leader for the Harlem Focus Series at the Smithsonian Institution's Cooper Hewitt Design Center. And then last but certainly not least to my left is uh, Amanda Davis, who is the project manager of the New York City LGBT Historic Sites Project, which at, where she oversees documentation and survey efforts. In 2018, she was named to the National Trust for Historic Preservation's inaugural 40 Under 40 People Saving Places list in recognition of her work to help tell the full American story. Amanda previously served as the Director of Preservation and Research at the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, I think I remember that, and worked as an architectural historian at Architectural Resources Group in Los Angeles and the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, so they've all got uh, really rich backgrounds and uh, wonderful um, experiences that they bring to the table today, and I'm looking forward to hearing from them, as I'm sure are you. Um, but I'm going to go first uh, with my presentation, and I'm going to largely focus on uh, the neighborhoods that we represent, Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo, and the progression in recent years of uh, LGBT history having a place in historic preservation. And to give a little bit of context, um, as with so many things connected to the LGBT movement, um, we've seen really dramatic progress in the last couple of years. Uh, from the not so distant past when there was virtually nothing happening in this regard uh, to recent years where we've seen some major, major leap forwards, leaps forward, which I want to talk to you about. So to give you some context for that, um, and for those of you who might not be kind of familiar with the minutia of how historic preservation works, um, uh, in New York City we have the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and when they decide that a site is uh, significant enough um, uh, they, choose, they can choose to either individually landmark it or landmark it as part of a historic district. And when they do that, they have to issue something called a designation report in which they say what it is about the place or the site that is significant, what it is that they're trying to honor, recognize, and protect. There's also something called the State National Register of Historic Places. Um, that's at the state and federal level, which similarly recognizes places of historic significance, but even though it's state and federal, it actually has much less power than city landmark designation. The city actually has the power to say, you can't change this, you can't tear this down, whereas for the most part, um, the state and federal designation is largely honorific. Important, but doesn't necessarily save the building. So I'm gonna start with the Greenwich Village Historic District, which forms the part of um, Greenwich Village, which was designated in 1969. You can see the map up here. Um, most of the neighborhood is covered uh, by it. Obviously a place incredibly, incredibly rich in LGBT history. Uh, designated uh, just 50 years ago, uh, the day before yesterday, April 29th, 1969. We had a big celebration about that, and that's going on throughout the year. But, as you might surmise, when the Greenwich Village Historic District was designated in 1969, and here's some sections of the um, designation report, there was literally no reference whatsoever to gay, lesbian, homosexual, anything. Um, first of all, the Stonewall uh, riots hadn't taken place yet. This was about two months beforehand. And to the degree to which there had been some LGBT activism in the neighborhood, 
or that it's certainly not mentioned, nor is the presence of a large LGBT community. So while much of Greenwich Village has enjoyed landmark protection since 1969, it's been on bases that have nothing to do with LGBT history uh, whatsoever. And as specific examples, here are three sites which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later. At the top is Julius's Bar, uh, number 159 uh, West 10th Street. Um, and you can see if you can read it from here, but basically it's just a very simple architectural description of the building. Nothing about the fact that a uh, sit-in had taken place there, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, uh, three years earlier that was one of the first planned acts of civil disobedience for LGBT rights. Um, below that is the Stonewall Inn. Um, no, ref obviously no reference to the not yet occurred riots, but not even a mention of there being a, uh, a gay bar uh, located in the building. The only note at the bottom is that it says that it was redesigned to serve as a restaurant. Um, and lastly, we have the center, the building in which we're located at 208 West 13th Street, which at the time was still the Food and Maritime Trades Vocational High School. Um, so it hadn't even become the center yet. In fact, I think nobody could have even imagined it becoming the center at this point in time. So certainly there's uh, no mention of that there. Um, now, by the way, there's something like 33,000 buildings in New York City that are landmarked, either individually or as parts of districts. And every year, the city landmarks uh, typically several hundred, <laughs> if not thousand, uh, more buildings. Doing a, a search of those records, and based on my knowledge, which is not exhaustive, the first occasion that I was able to find of there even being a mention of gay in a designation report is for this building here. The uh, former Yiddish Arts Theater, uh, which is now the uh, uh, Cinema Village uh, Movie Theater, on uh, 2nd Avenue and 12th Street, designated on February 9th, 1993, all the way at the very end of the designation report under miscellany, um, you can see that there's a reference that says, in the 1960s, the offices began to be converted into apartments. Three notable gay residents were Jackie Curtis, a drag superstar in Andy Warhol films, photographer Peter Pujar, who lived here from 1975 to 1987, and artist David Wojnarowicz, uh, who lived here from 1980 to 1992. Um, so this is a sort of incidental mention. Um, it's not the reason why the building has been designated. Um, and honestly, it's a, it's a kind of a, a stray, almost random occurrence um, in the uh, designation reports from the Sims Landmarks Preservation Commission. One of the developments which happened not long after this, which I think really set the stage for the progress that we're still making, is this is an online version that uh, uh, my organization, Village Preservation, uh, created of what was uh, called the Guide to Lesbian and Gay New York Historical Landmarks, put together in 1994 by the Organization of Lesbian and Gay Architects and Designers, uh, which no longer exists, but was very active in the 1990s and did some great work. This was a, a printed um, uh, map. Uh, we got uh, permission uh, to be able to turn it into an online map a couple of years ago, and so it now lives on, on our website. And as you can see, uh, and we just have the sections of it that are, are in our part of town, but it extended to places like Harlem and other parts of New York City, although a lot of it was centered in the downtown area. They did a, a really amazing job of documenting all of these sites of significance to LGBT history, which was great. In a lot of ways, the, the first step is kind of really documenting and, uh, and putting out there in a tangible way uh, that these sites do have this connection. But of course, this was a a, a, a nonprofit group that was saying, we think this is important, um, but it was still several steps away before it had the imprimatur of any sort of government uh, recognition or protection. So really the first step in that direction took place in 1999 on the 30th anniversary of the uh, Stonewall riots. Um, GDSHP, as we were known then, Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, and OLGAD um, were co-applicants for a nomination for having Stonewall listed on the state and national registers of historic places. This was the first time that any building had ever been listed on the state and national registers of historic places for significance uh, in connection to LGBT history. And if I'm not mistaken, and some of my fellow panelists might know better than I, 
I think there's tens of thousands, if not more, buildings on the state and national register across the country. Um, so up until this point, there was zero. And then in 1999, there was one. And by the way, this is the sort of the lowest rung. It's an important rung, but it's the very first rung on the ladder of recognition of uh, uh, historically significant sites by state and federal government. And so on this 30th anniversary, um, that recognition was, uh, was granted. Um, and it was certainly newsworthy, as you can see. It was covered by the New York Times. This was not something that had ever happened before. And unsurprisingly, of course, it did start with uh, someplace like Stonewall. Um, and here is a map that went along with the nomination. It's actually not just of the Stonewall building, but of the blocks around the Stonewall building. It was actually meant to capture all the places where the uh, riots, the fighting, took place over those uh, three nights, including the park uh, across the street. Um, so this was definitely um, uh, a giant leap forward. The next kind of tangible step in that process happened in 2003 with the designation of the Gansport Market Historic District in the Meatpacking District which was a, a landmark district that my organization, the uh, a Village Preservation, Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, really, really pushed. Um, I'll be honest, though, we didn't base it on LGBT history. We based it on a lot of other stuff. Uh, but fortunately, there were some good folks at the Landmarks Preservation Commission at the staff level who saw an opportunity here to highlight the LGBT history of this neighborhood when they did eventually move ahead with landmark designation. Um, and uh, I don't know how well you can read the section that's highlighted here, but I'll just read part of it to you. It says here, and this is a kind of general history of the neighborhood, it says, another presence that had emerged within the district of, during the 1970s were nightclubs, particularly those that catered to the gay community. The earliest was the zoo on West 13th Street in 1970, just a year after the Stonewall Rebellion. While the New York Times in 1995 disparaged the meatpacking district as a dreary patch between Hudson Street and 11th Avenue, it described its varied activities as followed. Night spots lie scattered, often tucked away, among the frigid warehouses of beef, pork, veal, and poultry. The meatpacking district runs around the clock. I'm sure some of us remember that. It's a little different now. And throughout, that there are market shifts in what goes on. Burly men in stained white overalls often unload meat trucks in the pre-dawn hours, just as club kids and bikers emerge from the late night hangouts, the district has always had a vibrant uh, gay and lesbian nightlife scene. Um, and uh, the, the Times went on to further comment about the presence of the gay community here. So this inclusion in terms of characterizing this district and its history was actually quite profound um, and trailblazing uh, at the time. And then moving forward in the report where they uh, went over the history of each individual building, you can see that several of these um, listed the presence of uh, gay clubs as part of the uh, important history of the building. Um, and you can see uh, some of them here. A lot of them were sex clubs, discos, uh, leather bars. Um, they were pretty inclusive in terms of what they uh, included in this report. Certainly, of course, the um, uh, the Triangle Building, which was known for uh, having a lot of these. And in this old picture from our archives, you can see the, uh, um, uh, the sign for Jay's, which is one of the main uh, clubs that was located in the building. So this was definitely a new development. Not long after that, in June of 2004, we pushed for and were able to get the designation of three row houses on uh, McDougal Street as landmarks. Three buildings that had actually been under consideration for landmark designation since the 1960s. Um, when the Landmarks Preservation Commission did designate, here again they took a, a, a kind of giant leap forward in terms of describing why these buildings were important to consider for designation for all three of them, they included in the designation report, what you can see on the upper right hand side, uh, quoting histor historian George Chauncey as having identified the importance of this block in the 1920s to New York's burgeoning lesbian and gay community. He had said, by the mid-1920s, the McDougal Street block south of Washington Square, the site of the Provincetown Playhouse, which is next door to these, or was, and numerous bohemian tea rooms, gift shops, and speakeasies had become the most important and certainly the best known locus of gay and lesbian commercial institutions and gay-run clubs on McDougal Street. 
Uh, although gay-run clubs on McDougal Street encountered opposition in the village, this should not obscure the fact that the very existence of such clubs in a middle-class cultural milieu was unprecedented. Uh, so this, uh, they're, they're sort of really speaking to the emergence of a gay community and a gay identity in this area as an important phase in these houses' uh, development and their significance. Specifically for uh, number 129, which is the house in the middle, it cited the fact that it was uh, the home of, of Eve Adams' Tea Room, uh, which was a, uh, an establishment run by a Polish Jewish, Jewish lesbian with a sign that read, Men are admitted but not welcome. After a police raid, uh, Eve Kochover, the proprietor, was convicted of obscenity uh, for lesbian love, a collection of short stories, and disorderly conduct, and was deported. Um, a village columnist in 1931 reminisced that her club was one of the most delightful hangouts the village ever had. So, uh, one of the few other uh, references to gay life uh, coming out of the Landmarks Preservation Commission was in 2004, this building on 30th Street and 5th Avenue, the Wilbraham, which was uh, one of a genre of apartment buildings in New York in the late 19th, early 20th century, known as bachelor apartments, or bachelor fl flats. Uh, and as you can see in the designation report, there's a very glancing reference to the fact that uh, one of the reasons why uh, bachelor flats became so popular was the emergence of a gay male community, um, as well as the attractions of the heterosexual sporting male culture. Um, as part of the reasons why these uh, places existed. Um, so then shortly after that, in uh, 2006, we were uh, successful in getting the uh, Weehawken Street Historic District designated. And for those of you who remember what Weehawken Street was like back in, in the day, there were certainly many uh, gay establishments connected to it. And here as well, there was a very significant mention of their presence in the designation report. A list of uh, gay bars and clubs that's literally about a mile long, which uh, considering that this uh, district included just 11 buildings is quite um, impressive. Um, but then we take another uh, huge leap forward uh, where we sort of, we get into the first uh, districts in New York City that were designated with, where the push for designation really had to do with and was in some ways based upon the LGBT history. So in 2007, uh, Village Preservation submitted a proposal um, for landmark designation of what we call the South Village, which you can see um, from the map here is the area of Greenwich Village south of Washington Square, which was not landmarked, which has an incredibly rich history connected to um, uh, immigration, Italian-American, uh, Bohemian history, African-American history, but also a very rich um, LGBT history. Um, and that was part of the proposal that we submitted um, to the LPC, and it was the first time we had submitted a proposal for landmark designation to the city where LGBT history was part of the rationale. Um, I don't know if anyone else had ever uh, done that previously in other locations, and uh, it had some great results, which we'll get to in a second. Um, shortly after that, we submitted a proposal for landmark designation of 101 Avenue A, the home of the Pyramid Club uh, in the East Village, um, and uh, this is a, a, um, a, a quote from the um, proposal that we submitted to the city, which certainly um, references the LGBT history, and specifically how the club was really the place that uh, gave birth to this sort of new, um, kind of politicized, uh, in-your-face form of drag performance art um, that emerged in, from the downtown scene in the early 1980s, uh, which eventually um, uh, morphed into the uh, Wigstock Drag Festival, among other uh, manifestations. Um, our having submitted this proposal garnered a bit of attention. Um, as you can see, a local paper um, decided to run a story called Push to Make Pyramid Club City's First Drag Landmark. Um, it was one of many elements of the uh, proposal that we had submitted, but it was the one that seemed to kind of catch the imagination or at least attention uh, of some people. Um, we also submitted uh, a um, request to the state to consider this site for um, uh, listing on the state national uh, register uh, for a determination of the eligibility, and we got back a positive response in uh, June of 2008, and the state said the building's more recent history as the home of the Pyramid Club, which opened here in 1979, represents the avant-garde and cultural, countercultural movement which emerged in the East Village, including performance art and socially conscious drag performances. Although this era of the building's history began less than 30 years ago, 
may be worthy of evaluation in the future. The state has these sort of strict rules that if the history is less than 30 years old, it has to be extremely special circumstances under which they uh, consider it. So uh, next, uh, Webster Hall. Uh, later that year, we also submitted a proposal for a landmark designation of Webster Hall, uh, where we cited the um, uh, LGBT history. Uh, fortunately, the Landmarks Preservation Commission agreed, and in the designation report, they pointed out that the hall was significant as a gathering place for the city's early 20th century lesbian and gay community, who felt welcome to attend the balls in drag and then sponsored their own events in the 1920s, um, which was a big part of uh, their hit uh, history. And starting in 2010, we began to get some progress on our proposed uh, South Village uh, Historic District. This first phase was designated uh, as an extension of the existing Village Village Historic District and included the site of Cafe Chino. Um, and in the designation report, the city said that after World War II, Greenwich Village again became the site of intense cultural exchange and creativity with the experimental theater and lesbian and gay movements exemplified within the historic district extension number two by number 31 Cornelia Street, the site of Cafe Chino, which was the birthplace of New York, of New York City's off-off-Broadway movement and the city's first gay meeting. So this is a pretty explicit reference which the entire Greenwich Village uh, Historic District designation report from 1969 was completely uh, lacking. And, uh, moving ahead, in 2012, the, the city began to consider uh, a large historic district in, East, in the East Village for the first time. And our organization, working with some partner local and citywide organizations, pushed really hard to have that district expanded, specifically to include 101 Avenue A. And if you look at this map here, so uh, the stuff in the red lines is what they originally proposed. The purple stuff is the stuff that we pushed the commission to add on, and that did, in fact, include 101 Avenue A which they did eventually uh, include and designate. And in the designation report, they said, opened in 1969 in a former meeting hall, it became a defining venue for avant-garde music and drag performances in the 1980s, hosting artists such as Ann Magnuson and RuPaul, and sponsoring early benefit concerts for AIDS victims. This was also the scene of, of one of the first New York shows for the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Nirvana. It remains the sole surviving music club from that period still in operation within the historic district. Then moving forward, in 2012, we submitted a, a request to the city's, uh, um, uh, rather to the State Historic Preservation Office for a determination of eligibility for uh, Julius's Bar, which in 1966 was the scene of this um, act of civil disobedience, the sip-in based on uh, southern sit-ins, uh, where members of the Mattachine Society in protest and challenging um, the regulation which prohibited uh, the service of alcohol to a known homosexual, uh, because that would be considered inherently disorderly, uh, went to several bars in the village, went up to the bar, ordered a drink, and stated that they were homosexuals, um, and more or less dared the bartender to refuse to serve them. Well, at Julius's, which was had an almost entirely gay clientele, but which had been raided by the police just a few days earlier, that's exactly what happened in this, and in this iconic image captured by Fred McDara, um, you can see the bartender, just once they've announced that they're homosexuals, is uh, covering the glass and saying, I cannot serve you. Um, and this helped lead to the overturning of that regulation, which helped lead to, uh, in effect, making gay bars no longer automatically illegal, which up to this point they had been. They really had to operate uh, sub rosa. Um, and as you can see, um, in 2012, when the state uh, did issue their positive uh, declaration of eligibility, they said to date there are only two sites on the National Register, and this is just in 2012, so not long ago, directly associated with LGBT history. New York City Stonewall and the recently listed Frank Kameny residence in Washington, D.C. So this is 2012. Uh, this is now the third site uh, that potentially could be listed on the uh, State National Register for LGBT history. Then we get to 2013, and we kind of hit the mother loop. This was when the Landmarks Preservation Commission moved forward with the second phase of our proposed South Village Historic District, um, south of Washington Square, which was an area that was incredibly rich in LGBT history. And I have to say, the um, very uh, skillful and uh, dedicated staff at the LPC went crazy 
Falls. Um, there's, for the first time ever, in a landmark designation report in the city of New York uh, for a historic district, there's an entire chapter on LGBT life and history talking about how in the 1910s and 1920s, this part of town was really the center of LGBT life and going through a long list of establishments um, located here and the role that they served, the um, raids that they suffered, um, and various other details about their significance. Um, not long after that, uh, we were able to get the entire uh, South Village uh, listed on the State National Register of Historic Places. This is in 2013. Um, and as you can see, uh, when it was designated by the city, um, by the state rather, they did specifically cite um, the gay and lesbian history as part of the reason why they were doing this. I believe, other than Stonewall, this was the first time that a district had ever been um, so designated for the state national register where uh, LGBT history was part of the rationale uh, for doing this. Um, I'm going to skip that one and then go to 2015. And it's uh, incredible to think that it's as recently as 2015 that we first got Stonewall landmarked in New York City. Um, uh, Village Preservation had waged a campaign for about a year and a half to get the city to designate it. I know that inside the Landmarks Preservation Commission there were staff members and others who have been agitating for it for quite some time. Um, even though it is located within a historic district because there was no mention of the LGBT history, um, we certainly felt that it was important to have that done. Um, and as you can see, just before the Stonewall anniversary in 2015, uh, the commission did finally designate Stonewall, which became, and to this day is, the first and only building landmark in New York City based on LGBT history. There is no other building in New York City that is landmarked because of its connection uh, to LGBT history. Um, and then the following year, um, the federal government actually elevated Stonewall to the highest position um, that can be granted in terms of acknowledging historic significance. It was named the Stonewall National uh, Monument, um, which was a, a great effort spearheaded, spearheaded by the National Parks Conservation Alliance and s several other folks. So uh, I'm gonna wrap, because I've actually gone way longer than I should have, um, but just by um, talking about these are the sort of successes. I want to quickly hit on some of the, the failures and the impediments. This is 2012, and this is 186 Spring Street, which is located in the southern part of the South Village Historic District that we proposed. Um, you can't see her in this picture, but Amanda is standing just off to the, to the side. Um, this was a house of extraordinary significance in relation to the um, LGBT uh, rights movement which was slated for demolition and which we sought to get the city um, to landmark. Um, and I wanna uh, uh, just quickly run through uh, some of the reasons why it was so significant. It was basically functioned as a gay commune um, for gay activists in the early 1970s. It was close to the uh, Gay Activist Alliance Firehouse on Worcester Street, which was just a couple of uh, uh, blocks away. Three important residents of the house included Jim Owls, who was the co-founder of the Gay Activist Alliance and it's one of its early presidents. Um, he uh, helped introduce the very first bill to outlaw um, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in New York City. He founded the very first lesbian and gay democratic club, Gay and Lesbian and Independent Democrats. In 1973, he became the first openly gay uh, candidate for public office in New York City. And in 1988, he was the co-founder of GLAD. Uh, Arnie Kantrowitz also lived there. He was the secretary and vice president of the Gay Activist Alliance, as well as a co-founder of GLAAD. He was also the co-author of Under the Rainbow, Growing Up Gay, which was the first biography of a gay activist. Most interestingly and sadly most forgotten was Bruce Veller, who lived in this house for about 12 years. Um, Dr. Bruce Veller was a specialist on human sexuality and sexually transmitted diseases, who was in the forefront of the fight against AIDS. He was an early president of the Gay Activist Alliance, which he left to found the National Gay Task Force, which he was the director of until 1978. Uh, he also founded the Mariposa Education and Research Foundation, one of the very first entities established to educate and change attitudes, attitudes about homosexuality and to reduce the stigma attached to sexuality in general. The foundation commissioned the George Siegel sculpture, Gay Liberation, that is in front of the Stonewall, 
and was one of the leaders in the late 70s and early 80s of the response to a mysterious, deadly ailment afflicting an increasing number of gay men and others in New York. Uh, Veller is said to have changed the inaccurate terminology for referring to the condition from gay-related immune defense disorder, or GRID, as it was initially known, to acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS, the more accurate name by which it came to be known. Uh, Veller and the Mariposa Foundation conducted the first studies in the early 1980s, establishing the effectiveness of condoms in preventing the spread of AIDS. This study was published by uh, Consumer Reports and had a profound impact on the response uh, to the epidemic. He was also the subject of a landmark Supreme Court case regarding parental rights for lesbians and gay men when he successfully sued for visitation rights for his children, which had never been uh, successful before. Um, it actually turned out when we did further research that that bill uh, banning anti-gay discrimination in New York City that um, uh, the residents of this house authored and introduced in the early 1970s was not just the first such bill in New York City, it was the first such bill in the country, and it became the basis for basically every uh, gay rights bill that has been enacted in the country, um, including the bills that are still pending before the uh, United States Congress. So uh, the city refused to designate the statement that federal government did recognize um, the significance of 186 uh, uh, Spring Street and said it was eligible for listing on the state national register. Sadly, the day after they did that, the uh, city issued demolition permits and the house was demolished. Um, adding insult to injury, it turned out that the developer who demolished the house did not actually have legal rights to the property, and so he illegally demolished it. Um, abetted by the city, uh, which is very unfortunate. So my final slide is just to say that um, we are still pushing for more recognition of the LGBT um, uh, historic sites. And uh, in 2014, when we began, began the campaign for the Stonewall, we also put forward three other sites which still have not been uh, considered for landmark designation. And they are Julius's, uh, the center, and the Gay Activist Alliance uh, Firehouse. Um, and we're very much pushing the city to landmark these uh, buildings, and we're hopeful that for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, they will. Um, and everybody will see on your chair, you have a handout that actually uh, is about exactly this, and uh, the one uh, get out of free jail card, so to speak, that you'll get for using your phones during this presentation is, you can see there's a little uh, URL at the bottom. If you just go to gbshp.org slash LGBT landmarks, you can right now or when you leave, uh, send letters to Mayor de Blasio and the chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission urging them to um, uh, designate these buildings in New York, as New York City landmarks. So uh, thank you very much for indulging me, and I want to uh, uh, turn it over to Victoria Monroe. I'm exhausted. <laughs> that was a lot of a very dense presentation. Thank you so much. That's so much to digest, and some of which I knew, and some of which I did not know. Um, of course, what I do know is how hard the work is. Uh, grueling, in fact. Um, I'm actually going to, sorry, this is a very sensitive microphone. Oh, come around. I want to stand up because I'm not as organized as Andrew and I don't have a printout. We can change this slide because you know I'm Victorian, right? Um, so this is the Alice Austin house. A very different story from Andrew's, but something that feeds into it. So we, and we have some incredible staff members here tonight, um, are a very small cottage on the waterfront of Staten Island, if uh, many of you probably have never been. Um, we're a, a, originally a Dutch farmhouse that was built in 1690, so architecturally very significant to New York's history. Um, but very importantly, um, Amanda and her team, Andrew Dogger uh, in particular, uh, worked tirelessly to amend our landmark 
designation to include LGBTQ um, as, as an area of historic significance for our site. We are called the Alice Austin House because we're named after its most famous resident, which was Alice Austin, who was born in 1866. Here's Alice. I can't do a talk without this incredibly well-known picture of her staring directly into the camera in her beautiful striped dress. Um, she was a photographer and uh, did leave us such an important amount of photographic history uh, for a changing New York born one year after the Civil War ended. Uh, such an extremely rapidly growing New York, uh, full of immigrants and so many other themes. And she was given her first camera at age 10 and was proficient in photography by the age of 18. The house itself, and I know we're all here because we're interested in LGBTQ history, we're interested in preservation history, architectural preservation, was her muse, and it was her studio, and it was a lifelong love affair. But her other lifelong love affair was Gertrude Tate. So Alice is seated and Gertrude is just behind Alice here. They were in a relationship for 53 years. Now the very good people that initially formed the Friends of Alice Austin House included such names as Bernie Savage. And I think their original intention, and as I've listened to various recordings of them, was that they were incredibly accepting of this relationship that Alice had with Gertrude Tate. And in the period that Alice actually lived, she had a little bit more freedom, believe it or not, because it was before such terms became difficult for the LGBTQ community, such as lesbian. So she would not have called herself a lesbian, but we call Alice a lesbian very proudly today. Um, but we like to make that clear that she wouldn't have used that term because it wasn't a term that would have been comfortable for her and Gertrude. Um, so the original Friends of Alice Austin House formed to protect the house. It was slated for demolition to build a high-rise building. It's on a beautiful waterfront view. If you want to go to the next slide, I hope it's... Oh, well these are some of the questions we asked ourselves, um, which I can just talk about without this slide if we go to the next one. We're in the interior of the Alice Austin house. So the very good people that helped save the house, they really lend their names to the courts, which Andrew, I, I, I would gather that, you know, that is part of a very important process is getting the support, of course, of people that are well known and named and that other people are gonna recognize. But post that process, we got landmarked, Parks became the owner of the property to a very large property and became the owner of the house. And that really became a community effort. And the borough president gave $1 million in 1984 to restore the house. That's when you could do it for $1 million. And some of the story got lost. And it was very, very, very important work that everyone was doing to make sure that this architectural structure was restored and repaired. But what some of the original intentions for how it would be as an open museum and representing the life and work of Alice Austin and a living museum for photography got a little bit muddled. And this happens a lot in historic houses. So what we ended up with was a few period rooms. Now, this is the dining room as it appeared six months ago and has been somewhat since we opened our doors in 1985. There's not a single object in this image, in this room, that Alice Austin owned. And could I just say to you again, she was a photographer and the house was her muse, one of her muses, and there's only one photograph in this room. Okay, she left us 8,000 photographs, people. 
So some very wonderful board members bought tables and sideboards and such that looked like things in her photographs. But is that helpful to us at the museum in sharing and imparting the story of Alice Austin's life and her work? And this often gets lost in historic places. And we really need to review what we are doing in terms of reaching out and connecting to people and honoring truthful storytelling in our houses. Now, if I bring in 30 people into this room, I can't, because there's a hulking great dining table in it. And I'm a tiny cottage. I want to talk about Alice's legacy. And I can still talk about the beauty of the architecture of the house at the same time without a dining table. This is a vision of white wealth. And it is not an experience. It is a roped off room. Oh, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> this is the parlor. I think this is a little bit more well done because we actually managed to get some donations of things back from Alice. Alice actually lost all her money in 1930 and so therefore had to start selling off all of her possessions and as a lesbian couple to try and stay in the house and support each other. And this is a very modern story. Uh, it was incredibly difficult for Alice and Gertrude and they struggled for 15 years and tried to run a tea room out of the beautiful site and such things but were eventually evicted. And so much of Alice's possessions are lost and have been gathered by other sites who want to hold on to them and you know, we constantly seek, or we would like to purchase them back, or hopefully they'll be donated, but very kind people have donated some objects. She never had a player organ. This is not her chair. These are not her things on the mantelpiece. Yes, the lamp. And there's only three photographs of the room as she photographed it, not of the room as she lived it. And what is really interesting about Alice's work is that she provided us with a social history. She was one of the, she's by no means the first woman to take photographs. She was one of the first women to actually take her camera outside of the studio. So what we get is an intimate portrait, if we can go to the next slide, of Victorian social life. And here's Alice, one of the few images of her actually smiling and her two Julias, her friends, dressed up as men with a wonderful umbrella in the centre. And this is 1891, people. You know? So when, when I'm teaching young, young people, they say to me, oh, is this a contemporary picture that's staged? And I'm like, no, seriously. And then they're like, 1891, I haven't even like said that number before. You know? And it's such a great, fun photograph. But it means so many things to us, doesn't it? It gives me tingles every time I look at it. As a lesbian woman, but for, for my kids to see it. You know? This is so important if we go to the next slide. Because we just can't talk about Alice without looking at these images. And this is the view from the Alice Austin house. This photograph is called The Darned Club. Alice and her friends, again, 1891. It was definitely a very creative year. I think she was having a lot of fun. She called it the lucky life. But the only interviews we really had with Alice is when she's in her late 80s, or sorry, early 80s, but you know, after a period of being in, in the courthouse. And um, what you get to see in these photographs is this like incredibly vibrant, creative, uh, artistic eye. But it's also, there's so much LGBTQ fun happening here. And there's so much more than what I have to show you today. So what I'm really talking about is interpretation. So here's Alice again, petticoats. This one's actually taken in St. John's Rectory, the Episcopal Pit church up the road uh, that she was christened at. And here's some of her friends just on the porch of the Alice Austin house. And this is what it looks like today. So the opportunity to come and visit us and actually experience these things 
but then to walk inside the house. And I know I've talked to so many people that have visited over the years, particularly lesbian women, that have made a pilgrimage to the house because they knew what we weren't saying. And Gertrude was written out of the story for all these years. There's a wonderful film about the preservation of the house and the efforts that went into it. Not once does it mention Gertrude. Not a photo in the house of Gertrude. None of these images on display. When I first went to visit the Ellis Austin house, I walked out of there. Somebody came up and said, oh, you can put $3 in this wicker basket and walked away. I walked out not knowing that it was the home of a significant photographer. I walked out of there not knowing that she was a lesbian woman, which would have been incredibly important to me. Granted, I didn't really do my research. I was just like, oh, where can I go on Staten Island for the day? Okay? And that should not happen. If we go to the next slide. Here's Alice, up on a fence post. Gertrude's actually staring at, at the unknown photographer. She's daring. She's a pioneer. There's so many themes in her work. We're here to talk about one theme tonight, but we seek to cover all the themes in her work, obviously. We want to celebrate the architecture of the Alice Austin House. We want to preserve everything. We want to make sure that we're there for every visitor. But we really, really, really think it's important to tell this LGBTQ history. And it's important for us, but it's important for everyone. It's not just the LGBTQ community. It's a part of history. And that's what we seek to integrate in a really meaningful way. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so as I said, so many things. She ventured out to Hoffman and Sundern Islands. She photographed immigrants on the street of New York. She would take up to 50 pounds of photographic equipment with her alone on the street strapped to her bicycle. It's phenomenal if we can change. And then it is, like I said, the LGBTQ community recognized it long before anyone in the house. And there was an active suppression. Uh, Barbara Hammer, who we sadly just lost this year, made a wonderful documentary called The Female Closet, which documented one of the protests that was had on our lawn. And we go to the next slide, sorry. So it began a little slowly. We started to do passive programming. We allowed uh, same-sex marriages on our lawn, because obviously we're a wonderful site to get married. And we started celebrating some of the photographs uh, that Alice took and uh, also hosting um, the Pride Center's uh, coming out day event. But they took care of everything. We were just like, yep, you can use our one. And then there was an active effort uh, to engage scholarship and really look at how are we going to start telling the story correctly? What language are we going to use? And we knew that there would be some pushback. And so we engaged a body of six scholars that came from various communities of art, photography, writing, but from an LGBTQ standpoint, uh, people like Lillian Federman and Richard Meyer, and they spent time with the collections and really looking at the house. And what we really felt like was that we, it was what we sort of knew, uh, but we needed words. And that, that really helped us. Um, if we go to the next slide. This one is not you to necessarily take in. It's just an example of looking at all the areas in the house where Alice's photography can tell the story that wasn't there previously. So much in such a small space. And so this will be the dining room in two weeks, I hope. <laughs> We're kind of like, things are under sheets and whatnot. But, but we're opening to the public um, 
on the 22nd and on May 22nd and May 19th will be our uh, opening of our first contemporary exhibition. We host two contemporary galleries, but it's also making the house more ADA accessible, uh, dedicating entire walls to Alice's social life, to Gertrude and Alice, to her camera and, and to the larger body of work uh, that she created. And so through this reinterpretation process and through wonderful partnerships uh, with people like Amanda, um, we, we began to create media and information and, and join in, actually join in uh, with marches and, and, and inclusive education programming. Uh, our site of significance was designated in 2017. Uh, and you can roll it through because I want to give everyone else time. And then this year was the first year that we actually started active storytelling within all of our programs and working with SAGE and uh, with high school GSAs and being that it was our first iteration of this, it's been a huge learning process. It's meant that we've been able to hire new staff and include all of the current staff in every project and that inclusiveness it's you know it spreads it's great it's really great uh and yeah, alice makes people happy she really does and <laughs> i think that was so much of what she wanted to always do um she was a party uh and 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 then we have two contemporary gallery spaces. Um, so we get the opportunity to support contemporary photography. We get the opportunity to display student photography too. Um, and, and do really high level programming. Um, so it becomes back to that original vision of those people that wanted to save the house. Um, and I think I, if you uploaded my, yes. So um, this has been, a nearly two year project of mine was to, I had always wanted to work with uh, Qualia Shaw and it's a Stonewall 50 exhibit that's going to open on May 19th in our contemporary galleries and um, it's portraits of uh, activists that were involved in the original Stonewall uprising and young people uh, that are, are really working incredibly hard in the community today and um, so we're extremely excited to open our whole new interpretation and with this. And I'd just like to close out with this because I was a little early today. And um, I, just, I just picked up this book, In Search of Stonewall, The Riots at 50. And, and it's different um, writings uh, from the Harvard Gay and Lesbian Review. And one of our... Um, participants in this project, her name's Carla J, and she's incredible. And I was reading um, what she wrote. And I, I like to keep reading these things, even though I'm very immersed in New York City history and Alice and, and whatnot, because it helps me out. Because sometimes, and we do, we get pushback from the community for this. It's like, hey, that's the Ellis Austin house. That's our place to hang out and walk our dogs. Why do you have to talk about gay shit? Anyway, uh, Carla was writing about uh, doing a, a march at the, at the very same time as the Christopher Street March, the very first one in 1917. She said, uh, one thing I had learned early on was to stay in the center of the crowd is the people on the edges were most likely to hit, get hit with flying debris. And I was like, <laughs> we kind of do this all the time, we have to protect ourselves a little bit. But the stories are really important. And uh, thanks for coming along tonight and being champions of this effort. And, you know, come out and visit us. We've got an awesome program during June. I know everyone's going to be really busy, busy, busy. And, uh, so at least maybe you can catch the beginning of it in May. And Staten Island's actually the first borough to kick off Pride this year. It is every year. Um, and we have a really quiet 
hike is to go. <laughs> it's on May 18th at Snow Harbour, which is an awesome historical site as well. So maybe really try and make it out. And if not, also come to the opening. 3 p.m. May 19th. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Victoria. That's a, what a great story of transformation. Um, and our next speaker is John Reddick. Well, my name is John Reddick, and I grew up in Philadelphia. And I want to start out by saying, you know, I'm in no way an extraordinary person. I went to public school. I had parents that didn't go to college. Uh, came to New York, and my greatest accomplishment, I feel, is my curiosity. And so my little talk today is going to be sort of like uh, um, cliff notes for our researchers and historians looking at the African American presence and the LGBT presence in, in New York or New York uh, culture. It's a picture of Langston Hughes, which I acquired in a flea market on uh, 18th Street. It's in front of his house. He's a, he's a senior gentleman uh, by this point. He's, he's vain enough to take off his glasses. And uh, I get a sense of what he was later in his uh, life. And I mean, really, because he was so popular, uh, it's been a, a real fight to sort of claim him as part of the LGBT community. And part of why, you know, uh, Stephen Watson did a great book about the Harlem Renaissance and talks about all the people that had unrequited love for Langston Hughes, men, women, you know, across uh, the board. And there's no real, I mean, the focus is always like on the sexual act. That's the diploma. But you can go to school, college for a long time before you get the diploma. <laughs> and uh, so part of trying to pull that, always trying to pull that history, that one aspect of the person's life into being the confirming aspect of who they are. And as an African American, if you uh, look at a lot of these images and when we talk, think about the culture at the time and the restrictions on African Americans. So when we pop up in a photograph in 1920 or 1930, you should be asking, why are they there? You know, and what's some other history about that person or that group that brings that person into that circle uh, of players? And uh, um, one of the people, one of the two things about Langston Hughes that helped me sort of sense it, he was in this LGBT community and he had a sort of partnership a kind of perspective on the lifestyle was his long uh, correspondence, there's a book about his correspondence between him and uh, uh, Carl Van Vecten, who's a writer, Bon Vivant, and sort of the linker of the African American players to downtown uh, cultural uh, life. It just went, there's a great show in, uh, that was at Columbia that looks at the African presence in French painting, Matisse and Manet, who just would say the Negress. And a woman just the research of who all these people were, and they were significant players. And I just went to the opening of that show in Paris, where they expanded the exhibition. And it's a blowout show. I mean, more people than the Picasso show are coming to it. It's because somebody looked at beyond that, just, uh, that title and just think about the famous artists. Think about the people in the, in the cultural life of those players. And so uh, these are pictures um, taken by Carl Van Victor over the length, expanse of Langston Hughes' life. And the center picture is taken by Richard Avedon. And uh, now it's just like a picture. He certainly looks like a vampire. I mean, he's made to look like, you know, he's the blood sucker of black culture, or at least of Langston Hughes in that relationship. It's taken by Richard Avedon. I'm sure Carl Van Victor came with a jacket on. But Avedon was a, um, a fashion photographer, and it was totally orchestrated to make him look like that. I really believe that Avedon, well, take your jacket off, let's see it was, he knows he was already, you know, white hair, very pale complexion. So it was a totally, so sort of inside gay joke almost in a way, a sort of bitchy little uh, insider activity to put him in that kind of position. So it's definitely Harper's bizarre put down of of Carl Van Vechten. But Carl Van Vechten, even in that awkward situation in terms of how he was perceived by both sides, both black and white, there's a lot of information about how he really, behind the scenes, tried to move relationships and connect African Americans into the institutional culture of the United States. And as an architect, uh, I went to visit Falling Water, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's home in, uh, near Pittsburgh, and I toured the house a thousand 
9,000 times, just several times, was totally focused on the house, and the interior, and how great the house was, and everything. And then a few years back, I go to visit, I've seen the house enough, I start to move around the garden, and I see the statue of an African American woman in the garden. I go, what does Frank Lloyd Wright have to do? You know, was an African American person, how did I get in the garden? So I go in and ask the curator, and he says, uh, well, the statues of Rose McClendon, an African American actress who I had not heard of, and uh, the sculpture was Richard Barthe, who was the gentleman above the porgy image. And I come back, and I look them up, and these two pictures were what popped up. And there's a DNA of Carl Van Vecten's photographs, because he always has fabric or something in the background. All his photographs are posed in front of fabric or some mass or some background activity. And uh, so, so that's what that was, that was curious. And the more I look at Carl Van Vecten's collection, I call it the mid 20th century Facebook. And my last check if someone's gay is to go to Carl Van Vecten's photo collection. That's the last check off in terms of uh, research. He was very, he came into wealth. He was like a million, millionaire in the, in the 20s and 30s. He came into a great, uh, someone passed away in his family, he became extremely uh, wealthy. He was married, but he was closeted. There was a whole portfolio of like gay photographs that came, became available visually uh, after he died. But you can go to the uh, Beinecke Library collection, which has, you can go online and access these photographs. He's also photographed like, um, uh, the pool, which was Colonial Pool at 145th Street, and it's all boys, it's all the boys at the side of the pool. There's all these things that are giving you clues, but you have to be willing to look. And part of the tutorial, particularly as an African American, I always realized there's no African American in some of these pictures of uh, height and achievement uh, without some unique story. I said, you can make a movie about any African American with a job because we didn't get it through the New York Times ad, we got it through some other way. And so if you look at gay culture or outside culture, you already have the antennae to look differently. You know, you don't, you know, I was born in straight parents, you know, uh, Philadelphia, all these other things, but to come into the LGBT life, you had to have a certain antennae to find your, your like minds. And I feel like that's the community that tells you, the community tells you more about the person than whether they had sex with another person or not. The community where they felt comfortable, where they felt they could be creative, and the avenues of expression is coming through that. And so after I knew that, I, just started to, I went to Carl Van Vecten's letters, and I could see that uh, Bruce Nugent, who's a gentleman here, had been a lover of, uh, um, of uh, Richard Barthe. But the bigger question is how the, the sculpture got into the house. And I looked and found out, oh, it's the Bronfman's. Not the Bronfman's. Uh, Oh, um, Kaufman, Edgar Kaufman, but a department store in Pittsburgh, and his family was already buying what was the contemporary China, you know, detailed artists, creative artists of the period. He's the one that convinced his parents to hire Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, so he that sculpture on his father's desk of, of uh, Edgar Kaufman Jr. was done by Richard Barthe. And so he realized he's cultivating a relationship between his parents and Barthe by giving them a gift of their own son. And then later on, when Wright does the house, he comes back and encourages them to buy uh, some artwork. And for most African Americans, if Barthe's picture, you know, not for us, but in the general public, it has to be about sex. Well, they were screwing each other. It's not the brain, it's the dick, you know. And it undermines the, the cultural parallels these people are making out of. Uh, Kaufman and that group, more than sex, was about culture and being at the top of the heap of culture. And so if you see these other players in their sphere, it's because they see them in peers in a lot of other ways than just the sexual uh, aspect of that relationship. And, th and that's just as nurturing and just as broad a part of their lives as the sexual uh, part. And I think we do a disservice when we just think about us as clubs and you know all these other things. It was this human engagement. And I feel like in the American story, all of us give up something to be American, and it's self-imposed. It's like, oh, my parents didn't speak English. I was poor from West Virginia. Whatever it is you decide to edit out, then you resent it in somebody else that comes and did not happen to learn English or didn't have to do this. It's this rub about the other person not, you know, having to go through the same thing. And I said, there's a kind of rigor in how history looks at the African American and not puts him in. The, in in the broader spectrum of the cultural life of gay people in the same way as in that cultural life. And I feel as, as gay people doing research, we should be a little more sensitive 
to that inclusion and, and, and a little broader, and so sort of our antennae picking up other bits of information. Uh, for example, um, this is Philip Johnson up in the corner, and his, uh, one of his early partners was uh, Billy Daniels, this gentleman in the, in the center. This is a Van Pecton photograph again in the center. And Philip Johnson later in life says, oh, that was really the love of my life, but I never had the nerve, you know, the backbone to stand up to the cultural pressures of having an African-American uh, partner. Uh, Billy Daniels was extremely sophisticated, to, and Johnson had wealth, but he was a hayseed from the Midwest. So in the beginning of their relationship, the more sophisticated person was more likely to have been uh, Billy Daniels than Philip Johnson. And uh, again, he, uh, there's a statue uh, head of um, Billy Daniels by Barthay, but this is also a picture of uh, Daniels by Horst. So you see this, so when you see, going into your research, and you see this black face, and, you have to come, remember what's the black face, they sort of think it's a one, it's sort of like a knockoff. If you kind of follow those people's career, you see they're popping up in a broader circle of, of players. So, you know, Billy Daniels being photographed by Horst, uh, by Carl Van Vechten, he's been a partner uh, with um, Johnson, who's an extremely successful, during the Harlem Renaissance, cabaret player uh, in Harlem. But by the 60s, he comes down and he runs Bonsoir, in the, in the village on 8th Avenue. And it's his sophistication that's booking Phyllis Diller and Barbara Streisand. You know, he's, he's a cabaret performer from back in the 20s and, and 30s, this is sophisticated. And so when these kind of, these names and players keep repeating coming up, then they're worthy of some level of acknowledgement or inclusion on the broader fact of what's going on here. It wasn't just about, you know, gay people, but maybe there were Latino people, African American people that were part of that networking out of their sexuality, but also the broader sense of inclusion because they didn't felt they felt vulnerable and outsiders just the way the other players are. And there's a natural relationship just in terms of their feelings about life and that struggle of life that we should be talking about as part and parcel of those relationships. And this is one of my favorites. In 1954, a show called House of Flowers comes to New York. And uh, George Balanchine was initially the choreographer who was fired. I'm not trying to say he was gay. I don't, I don't really know much about his, his life. But he he's comes from Russia. Everyone's looking to him to be this great ballet master to pull America forward into the cultural heavens. He's doing all these black shows. He's getting fired. He's, he did Kevin in the Sky choreography with um, Catherine Dunham. So what he's coming to America for is to pick up what he didn't get in Russia, this aspect of learning the black dance and Af the African roots of, uh, of dance. Uh, that show was written by Truman Capote. Uh, music was by, um, is there a theater piece in here? I can't think of the gentleman's name. Yeah, but uh, a very famous uh, musical composer. Uh, but for that show, Alvin Ailey comes to New York with Carmen de Lavala from California. Jeffrey Halder comes to New York. Uh, this is Arthur Mitchell, uh, Lewis Johnson, and Donnie McHale. Uh, um, um, Alvin Ailey and uh, um, Arthur Mitchell, the Institute of Harlem here, the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. All these gentlemen were choreographers and had small dance companies of their, of their own. I could either through direct knowledge or indirect knowledge tell you who all was gay in this, these pictures or not, but some are married, some live other lives. Some families would sue me if I actually was put in writing that they were gay, but I don't even need that to say within the cultural sphere of influence that was a major part of how they saw the world and how they engaged and had relationships, professional relationships across uh, the board with one another. And, and, and again, so stepping back and looking at all this, like how and we as historians and writers looking beyond this sort, of, this sort of slight giggle that it's about sex and we start to really honor the intellectual engagement of all, all the players in our culture. And I think as people, LGBT people, I think we have a leg up. As an African American, I feel I have a leg up because I'm looking at the world from a sort of slightly 
a skewed position. I'm left-handed, and probably why I think of in architecture, it's like things weren't working for me, and I couldn't figure out why they weren't working for me. I just adjusted. But your brain's doing something while you're making that adjustment in a certain way. Maybe you're noticing things that you don't notice. So as an African-American, I think I see the world slightly skewed. And I always tell people, uh, I grew up, and I know um, Picasso and Leger and Bearden, and I'm not exceptional. So it shouldn't be hard for me to ask other people to put themselves in the same position and look at cultures outside the ones they grow up in. Think about, you know, even if you're gay, think about what the straight culture has to do. Or if you're Spanish, think about what the Italian culture has to do. These are all clues. We share a lot of those same uh, points of view together. And I feel it would be a much richer dialogue amongst all of us. We step back a little bit and look a little bit more at the cross-pollination. I feel like that's what really makes America. If we're a melting pot, it's a stew, and a stew is part of a lot of different players in that at stew. And it's a richer story, I think, if we can really learn to incorporate and think about that a little more. Thank you so much, John. And now, last but not least, we have uh, Amanda Davis. Hi hey everyone, thanks for, for coming out. And, um, I know you've digested a lot, and uh, I'm gonna go more into the historic preservation angle of things, so hopefully it doesn't get too technical. But um, So um, the, our project, um, uh, we have a tagline, Making an Invisible History Visible. Uh, the goal of the project, um, it's the first initiative to document historic and cultural sites associated with the LGBT community in all five boroughs, not just Manhattan. Um, and we're looking at sites not only that clearly reflect LGBT history in New York, but how the community has impacted New York City and American culture. And there are other projects like ours in the country, but we feel we're one, maybe the only, that actually looks at it twofold to put that uh, second spin on it and how the community is impacting um, our history collectively. Um, but before I talk about our project, I just kind of wanted to, uh, Andrew touched on this earlier, uh, but the, really, the beginnings of uh, recognizing LGBT place-based history in the historic preservation movement, it began in the early 1990s um, with, as Andrew mentioned, this OLGAD map. Uh, which was created in 93-94 in honor of Stonewall 25, 25th anniversary of the uprising. It focused on Greenwich Village, Midtown, and Harlem, and we believe it was the first uh, map of its kind to recognize LGBT historic sites. And three of the creators of this map are the founders of our project. Uh, at the same time, uh, Ken Lasbader, one of our project directors, was a graduate student at Columbia in the Historic Preservation uh, Program. And he uh, wrote a thesis, Landscape of Liberation, Preserving Gay and Lesbian History in Greenwich Village. This is in 93, and when I first heard that, I said, really, it hadn't been done before? <laughs> Showing my age, I guess, and my naivete uh, about why the history in New York wouldn't have been covered, but it was very pioneering. Um, and um, Andrew mentioned this earlier, Jay Shockley, one of our um, founders, uh, wrote the designation report for the Jaffe Art Theater, which was designated in 93, and, and yes, was the first mention of the word gay in a designation report. Jay, uh, if you're not familiar, had been working at the Landmarks Commission since 1979, uh, and I promise you, if any of you know Jay, that he would have incorporated LGBT history the day before he started in 1979. Incredibly passionate and knowledgeable about this history, but if you don't have the go-ahead uh, as, as a city employee, you have to kind of wait it out. Um, but uh, five years later, um, he and Gail Harris, another pioneer and unsung hero at the Landmarks Commission, um, inclu included the first use of the word lesbian uh, in the historic district report for the Elizabeth Marbury and Elsie DeWolf residence. Uh, this is the East 17th Street Irving Place Historic District. All the sites that I'm going to mention, by the way, on our website, so if you're curious to learn more about the history, I'm not going to go into that because we'll be here all night. <laughs> Um, and Andrew mentioned Stonewall. Um, the first attempt actually happened in 1994, and again in honor of Stonewall 25. Um, Gail Harris proposed while working with Olgad that they should reach out and try to get enlisted for Stonewall 25, but at the time the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior gave a reason that they felt there was not enough context, it was too recent, why would you commemorate a riot, and so nothing happened. 
Five years later, they tried again, um, and it was successfully listed. It was the lead author was Andrew Dolkert, one of our founders, uh, Gail Harris and Jay Shockley, using additional research from David Carter, who was in the process of writing his uh, Stonewall book, which is considered the definitive uh, telling of the uprising. Um, and I won't go into the other history since Andrew already covered it. Um, but the interesting thing about the boundaries of the district was you, the State Historic Preservation Office requires owner consent. And at the time, the Stonewall did not, the owners did not want to get it. So our, the coordinator at, at, the, at the state realized that most of the action actually took place on the streets. And she used the precedent of how we recognize Civil War battlefields to create the boundaries of the district. Um, so by doing that, the city of New York became 50% owner uh, of the district, and they gave their approval, and they were able to move ahead with the listing. So very creative <laughs> staff member at the state. She's actually the National Register Coordinator and is still there. Um, so moving ahead to 2011, really starting to get historic preservation Historic preservation is thinking about documenting LGBT history. Um, three, the three founders of our project are there with Madeline Davis, uh, a Buffalo historian, Buffalo, New York. Um, they presented at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, Jay uh, organized this panel to get people really start thinking about this because they got a lot of question marks. Like, what? What are you talking about? Like bars? Um, so it was it was a really important step in the historic preservation movement. Um, and then fast forward to 2015, our project uh, began, and uh, we were founded through uh, initial funding from the Department of the Interior uh, and the National Park Service's Underrepresented Communities Grants Program. So really, this was under the Obama administration, a very different time. <laughs> but um, it was meant to provide grants, not just for LGBT history, but women's history, African American history, Latino, so on and so forth. And this was one of the, uh, the projects that got funded through that in part. Um, so the goal of the project, not only to document sites throughout the five boroughs, to make, but to make our findings publicly accessible on an online map, nominate sites to the New York State and National Register of Historic Places, very importantly, educate the, pe uh, the public about this history well, well beyond Stonewall and well before, and advocate for the protection of, of these sites. And really, it's so important to get people to not only understand that this history exists, but that it is serious and significant and should be taken as such because you can't get people to support your advocacy work if they don't know it exists and if they don't take it seriously. So education is a huge part of what we do. Um, so just I'm going to just pull two of the National Register nominations that we worked on. Uh, Julius's bar uh, was the first that we uh, worked on and Andrew Dolkart was the lead author of that nomination, and it was listed a day before the 50th anniversary in 2016, which was super exciting. Um, and here are uh, Randy Wicker and Dick Leish, two of the participants of that sip-in. Um, I brought the little This Place Matters sign because I couldn't resist the opportunity. Um, so that was a really fun day. Um, Cafe Chino, I'm particularly proud of because I actually wrote that nomination. Um, and to me, it encapsulates so much of what the village was about in the 50s and 60s. Really wonderful history. Uh, it was listed in 2017, the birthplace of Off Off Broadway, but also of gay theater. That second part is often omitted from its significance, so I always try to push it. Um, and then you can see overall, this is the state of historic uh, sites listed on the National Register throughout the United States. Uh, there are three categories. Obviously, Stonewall is listed in all three. I've highlighted all the New York City-based um, sites. We've written all but the Bayard Rustin residence. A colleague of ours in DC wrote that one. Um, and uh, there, But there are sites all over the country. Finally, uh, last year, two years ago, San Francisco, I said, what's happening in California? Let's go. So um, in Boulder, we just heard from a colleague in Boulder that two were listed there just recently. So we're up to 21 sites. And these are sites listed primarily for their LGBT significance. There are over 93,500 sites on the National Register. Undoubtedly, so many can be reinterpreted for their LGBT history and the history of many other marginalized groups. Um, so we have two others currently in the pipeline that we've just submitted to New York State. This is the Church of the Holy Apostles in Chelsea, which was a really important um, early post-Stonewall gathering space for LGBT groups and congregations. Uh, gay the gay synagogue is uh, 
uh, Bay of Clement Torah, which was in West Beth for a long time. Um, and there's a, that one on the end there is for a, a lesbian dance. It's kind of hard to read, but a really important social space. And we're also, we've just, we uh, brought on a consultant to help us work on a nomination for James Baldwin's residence on the Upper West Side. He lived also in Greenwich Village famously and it really shaped him, but though that building is actually more attractive, <laughs> this building is more authentic. It looks, the way, it looks the way it did when he lived here the last 22 years of his life. Uh, and he moved his family, his mother, his uh, sisters, two of his sisters and nieces and nephews here. Uh, and a couple weeks ago, I was texting the James Baldwin nephew, which is one of the highlights of my career, probably. Uh, but they said the importance of this house to them is they called it headquarters. Uh, so that's a really exciting nomination we're working on. Uh, so this is our website. This is our mo most public face. Um, you can see we have these color-coded, as historic preservationists, we love property types and dividing them up um, as a way to categorize this history. We're looking at sites from the 17th century, as early as we can find them, they have to still exist. Up until the year 2000, we had to find a, a, a time to cut it off. 2000 is actually pretty late for a survey, but we wanted to include the AIDS epidemic, uh, more diverse groups that formed in the 80s and 90s, um, and, the, uh, and other sites uh, that may not necessarily have been covered. And also, also after Stonewall, you start to see a more, much more open presence, so really documenting that history as well which is an interesting thing to think of when you're documenting marginalized groups. You have to kind of think outside the box. You can't go by traditional uh, standards in many ways. Uh, and so we also have these ways to filter, so cultural significance. I've checked off literature, and you can see Langston Hughes' residence is one that pops up. If you were to click on that, you would read a, a more prolonged history with um, historic photos um, and vi visuals and videos and things like that. And we try to link all of these so they really kind of tell a story. And you can also search by neighborhood, by time period, etc. And you know, for people who don't want to just look at pins on the map, we currently have about 170 and counting. We're always adding more. Uh, we've created themes that rotate throughout the year. And we also kind of love these because they tell a story. They kind of bring out important themes that people may not be thinking about. Importantly, that history began well before Stonewall, and that it's much broader than uh, people may think, um, and much more diverse, so telling a lot of stories. And we have um, our eight site types, I'm just going to give you a quick example, I won't go through the history because we're running well behind, but an example of a cultural and educational institution is the Little Red Schoolhouse on Bleecker. Uh, Elizabeth Irwin, who today we may define as a lesbian, uh, ran the school, founded the school, and lived nearby with her partner. So showing the influence of the LGBT community, in this case, uh, lesbian progressive reformers in this time period. The Henry Street Settlement is another example. Um, residences, former residences of notable figures, though we've made an exception for Larry Kramer. <laughs> He's still there. Um, so Lorraine Hansberry's residence on Bleecker Street, uh, a really great little building. This is where she was living when she wrote A Raisin in the Sun and when it premiered on Broadway, making her the first black woman to have a play produced on Broadway. Um, and um, she also <laughs> wrote lesbian uh, short stories uh, to um, the National Newsletter, the Daughters of Belitis National Newsletter. She privately identified as a lesbian. This is a site we teach to public high schools and kids know about A Raisin in the Sun and they really light up, along with Langston Hughes, to know that they were uh, gay and lesbian. Um, so public spaces, such as where activism took place, this is the second ever U.S. gay rights protest. Uh, it happened in front of the Cooper Union in the fall of 1964. Uh, Kayla Usen and Randy Wicker, two early pioneering LGBT rights activists, uh, were picketing a, a session that was happening at this time, psychiatrists convening to talk about homosexuality as a mental disorder. Um, so really brave in their time to have their faces and, and their names out there. Um, organization and community spaces, such as the Washington Square United Methodist Church and Parish House, which is now luxury condos um, on 4th Street, uh, it was a really incredibly important space. Reverend Paul Abels was the first openly gay minister of um, a, a big congregation. 
in the country. The Salsa Soul Sisters were here for 15 years, an important meeting space for lesbians of color, and uh, these other groups here met here as well. Uh, so moving outside the village, I picked village sites given the, given the location of our presentation tonight and the GVSHP, but uh, moving outside the village to performance venues, although there are in the village, um, I uh, pulling out the Torch Song Trilogy, which actually had its start in La Mama, so a little East Village love here, um, and talking about um, LGBT-specific works, but also the community's impact uh, on theater in general, which is endless, actually. So, um, stores and businesses, Keith Haring's studio and foundation on Broadway, where the art artist had his studio the last five years of his life before uh, dying of AIDS-related complications. And I think, um, okay, so and medical facilities will largely be associated with the AIDS epidemic. Rivington House on the Lower East Side um, was an AIDS hospice for a very long time in the 90s and 2000s. And um, you may remember the name Terry Miller, who was a chronicler of the village. This is where he passed away uh, from AIDS. And we actually also have bars, clubs, and restaurants, probably the most obvious choice, and I thought I had it in the PowerPoint. Uh, I had the Sea Colony, which was an early lesbian bar. Um, so there was that one for you. Um, so very importantly, uh, we're, we want to put this history into context to help historic preservation uh, staff people at the local and state and national levels uh, look, know how to evaluate these structures because it's, it's relatively new. So our grant included writing this historic context statement for LGBT history in New York City. Uh, and we divided it out into um, different chapters of major themes um, up until the year 2000. And these are just two themes that we, that we cover. The emergence of an LGBT subculture in New York City, 1840s to World War I, and the development of lesbian and gay Greenwich Village in Harlem between the wars. Um, and then we provide an evaluation framework. This is to help tell historic preservation professionals evaluating LGBT structures, what to look for, rarity, uh, earliest example of, or yes, you should take bars seriously, like don't think that's just a silly thing to, to preserve, that it has real value to the community. So really making people aware of what to look for. And this is an example of, uh, from the chapter of New York City and the AIDS epidemic. And this is Larry Kramer and his residence. Um, so we've also uh, provided the, the Landmarks Commission with recommendations. We met with them in February, along with uh, a representative from Speaker Corey Johnson's office. Um, these are just uh, the ones that we had proposed to move forward with, um, and we provided them with a little bit more information. Um, so hopefully we'll be moving ahead, as Andrew said, with something before Stonewall. We have our, um, we have our hopes up. So um, Jay Shockley, we're also trying to move this nationally, um, and Jay Shockley, who's really done just so much with this work, uh, provided the New York City chapter of this broader publication called LGBTQ America, which uh, you should check out. It's uh, on the National Park Service's website. We also have a link to it uh, from scholars around the country talking about these issues. And we've also worked with the National Parks Conservation Association to create this walking tour map of sites around Stonewall, um, which is, uh, there's a park ranger that hands these out and they're in nearby bars as well. Um, and then with Making Gay History, which is a really great podcast, if you don't know, uh, the New York Public Library and some other groups, we've created this Stonewall Basics as I'm sure you know, there are many, <laughs> many different stories and myths around what happened at Stonewall, so this is just one way to um, try to navigate that um, you know, complex, complex narrative. This is also available on our website. And just finally, looking to really broaden the picture again and speaking with uh, scholars around the country, we held and internationally, we worked with the Columbia um, Gay Student Group um, in the last month to create an LGBTQ symposium which was held at Columbia um, and it was intentionally, there was no one from New York City on the panel so we wanted to hear from, from people, um, this, this panel includes two people, people from San Francisco which is probably not unexpected but also someone from Louisville, Kentucky talking about a statewide LGBTQ survey happening in Kentucky that was completed um, and then people um, from um, England and India 
and uh, so forth. So this queer symposium is actually, the students did, there's a famous, well we, we think it's famous, uh, the students of uh, the Gay Columbia group in the 1970s had a, this poster and said gay dance, pointing to Earl Hall, who was the site of uh, very early gay dances. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we are in historic preservation, and it's great to see that things are happening not just in New York City, but elsewhere and internationally, and seeing the challenges. I mean, we've had people, there was someone at the symposium from Africa who said, you know, I had to run from my hometown. I couldn't even talk about this as an issue because I was worried for my own safety. And my friend from San Francisco, she's like, I walked away feeling so guilty because we're doing so much in San Francisco and what a privilege it is to be able to do that. But it's still important, I always feel like, if we're not doing it in New York and San Francisco, the two obvious places, then it's not necessarily happening elsewhere, and it has been really important and I think um, eye-opening. And and we've also gotten young people um, involved, which has been really I think in historic preservation the million-dollar question is how do you get younger people involved and in being interested in this history? And we've had so many people who young people who said, you know, when I read these stories, I really relate to them, and I can't believe that someone like me existed. 100 years ago, and not only did they exist, but they were thriving. And, and so I think the stories that we've heard from people of all ages has been one of the most rewarding uh, aspects of this project. Um, and this is just a little shout out. If you'd like to learn more, we're on social media um, at NYC LGBT sites. And um, thanks, thanks for hearing me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda, and to all the panelists. We are uh, running a little late, and I'm as guilty of that, if not more than anyone. But uh, we can take a couple of quick questions from the audience, uh, if anybody has anything. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, in the previous slide, you had mentioned um, the Walt Whitman House. Um, where does that stand? I mean, I would have thought that that was an easy one for landmark commission, but is that, uh, what are the chances of that being landmark? Yeah. Easy is, is a little hard because <laughs> um, the Landmarks Commission, though they are moving forward with more cultural designations associated with cultural landmarks, they still have a hard time grappling with buildings that have lost their architectural integrity. Um, the building itself, and there's a Brad in the back can tell you the whole, the whole story. Uh, the building in Brooklyn, it was a two-story wood-framed house. It's now vinyl siding, which probably wouldn't have been the issue, but it's got a third story added to it. The only building in that row with a third story added, which is a real shame. Um, and he was only there for a year, but what we've tried to, to push with them is that he actually never really lived long anywhere. He had over 30 locations in New York City, and this is the only one extent. And given this is where he finished um, Leaves of Grass, which is one of the most important American works of poetry. Uh, we're, we're not giving up. As I said, Brad back there is, is a one-man machine. As far as like pushing the Landmarks Commission, uh, we would love to see that come through, but, yeah. Can you get? Yes, Mike. Can I just 
say that you just answered your own question. Um, and very astutely because you were there. Um, so, as Amanda was saying, you know, we have this Stonewall 50 consortium. We've been meeting for a couple of years now. It's gone from being about 17 institutions at the table to over 175. One of the most lively debates we had was how we refer to the Stonewall 50 um, rebellion, riots, uprising. Now, a lot of people that were there said, no, it was a riot. If you're going to call it something else, then you're diminishing what we might have gone through on that line on line. Um, people said, well, we, 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 you know, we want to explain this to young people. We want it to sound really also positive. And there was all this positive energy as well. It was um, a party and this really great feeling and like we're doing something. And so it was kind of like an uprising. So um, at the end of the day, I think we agreed to disagree on some things, and we decided that uprising was the way that the consortium would refer to um, the events uh, of, of, of that Stonewall uh, series of, of nights. Um, but absolutely, uh, hearing you talk about it just then was the better way to talk about it was is to say it was a rebellion, an uprising, and riot. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, I, it's great that you raised that, and I think it really speaks to the whole um, process of making history and how we choose to tell these stories, how they get remembered, whose voices are represented, how they're uh, framed. One of the things that always impresses me so much about Stonewall is that uh, you know, in the court, I'm, I'm actually, I turned 50 this year, I was born six months before Stonewall, so I sort of lived through the evolution of where the place of Stonewall in the sort of popular consciousness, and to see how that has evolved over those 50 years from something that was known, recognized, to say nothing of, you know, sort of honored or celebrated from by a very, very small group of persistent people who use this anniversary as a way to remind uh, themselves and others that this was an important event and that it, 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 it gave important lessons to something that's recognized now on a global uh, scale um, is really incredible to see how that's evolved. And it's evolved partly because people work very, very hard um, to make that happen. But, uh, you know, history is constructed um, and we all play a role in constructing it. And I think that uh, the, the questions you raise really speak to exactly how that process takes place. So uh, if there's no other questions, since we are running late, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to these wonderful panelists. Um, and please uh, continue to participate in, in these Stonewall 50 programs.